Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for Stress Busters for Parents. Put your oxygen mask on first. Today, Susanna will be talking about how to take care of your own mental health so you can better help your kids and others in your life. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Susanna Horwitz, a trauma-informed expressive arts therapist and licensed professional counselor with a private practice in Golden, Colorado. She specializes in working with adolescent and young adult individuals seeking support for managing responses to anxiety, panic, depression, and post-traumatic stress. Before I hand the mic over to Susanna, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this presentation. First, this webinar will be available on demand after the live session, and we'll email that out to you along with additional resources in the slide deck. I would also encourage you to visit our website, jcmh.org, where you'll find more information about how to get started if you're interested in talking with a therapist, as well as blog posts and information about upcoming webinars on other mental health topics. Please keep your microphones muted and turn off your video during the presentation. You'll also want to change your Zoom view to speaker mode for the best viewing experience. Next, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to send it through the chat at the, at the bottom of your player. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow up afterwards. And last, we'd like to encourage you to follow us on our social networks and share the recording of this webinar and other information about Jefferson Center. So without further ado, Susanna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who was able to make it here in the middle of today. I know that some uh, people may have been signed up for the workshop that had a lot of technical difficulties and I appreciate you maybe wanting to come back and see what we're doing here. So um, the title Stress Busters for Parents, Put Your Oxygen Mask On First is, um, as I mentioned to uh, some of the people from JCMH who so graciously allowed me to do this today, um, is really uh, something that I resonate with a lot because not only am I a therapist, but I'm also a parent, a parent of a seven-year-old. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of what I am going to be talking about today are things that maybe I would have used before I was a parent. Um, I definitely would have worked with families and talked to um, kids and teens about in the in the past, but it's really it hits home more, and it's got a deeper meaning for me more now that I'm a parent. And just you know, I I have a sense of humor about a lot of things, but specifically about myself, um, because I often think it's so funny that I am leading a workshop called Stress Busters for Parents. But you ask the match on first because this is something that I actually need too. So. Just so you know, you are not alone. Just because I am presenting this does not mean that I don't need to practice it every single day. Also, and also forget to practice these things sometimes and need some reminders. So I appreciate you guys being here today. So um, I think I just wanted to start with just some intention setting. I'm gonna try to see if I can move this forward. <laughs> oh, there we go. Moving a little slowly. There we go. So welcome. Um, and just to sort of to start off, I think just the basic gist of what I like to talk about when I'm talking about stress busting is starting with intention. And you may have heard this all over the place, whether it's something that you've um, heard through guided meditations or yoga classes or exercise classes or um, something that you've done spiritually or with the church or a synagogue or something like that. Intention setting often is just a way of pausing and being in the present moment, which is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Pausing and checking in and going, huh, where am I? Okay, what's next? And so I think especially as parents, we have a lot of times where we're just running, 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 and we don't take that time to really pause and kind of go, huh, well, what's my intention here? Sometimes we say we don't have time, which really you're going to see here today a lot of the things that I'm talking about. And again, I think we all need reminders about this intention setting and uh, mindfulness practice and all of these things. It does not require more than maybe two or three seconds of your time um, and maybe kind of doing it throughout the day. So the question is just to pause and think about for a moment for today and this workshop. What brought you here today? And what are you hoping to learn from this workshop? Um, I don't know if there's a way for you to sort of like put this into a text box or something like that, um, that we can look at. 
um, later and an answer some questions, or maybe you can just write it down for yourself when we're doing questions and answers at the end. Um, but it just might be something to kind of pause and think about, even if you don't have pen and paper in front of you to write something down. But just thinking, what is it that brought you here today? Just something simple. Um, what are you hoping to learn from this workshop? So that then when we get to the end, you can maybe come back and return and go, hmm, well, did I get the answer to my question? If not, let me see if I can ask it. So just going to kind of let ourselves kind of think about that while we're moving into the next question, which is why is it so important to put your oxygen mask on first? So I'm sure that if those of you who have traveled via airplane um, know that this comes directly from the line that they will say to you on an airplane, which is if <laughs> there's a loss of cabin pressure, um, the oxygen masks will drop. And please, if you are traveling with somebody who is maybe more vulnerable than you, younger or uh, an uh, elder or something like that, please put your oxygen mask on first before putting on the mask of others. Now, it's something that if we have traveled a lot, we've heard and we just sort of like hear it. I like to relate it as a metaphor for just life in general. And you may have heard this as a metaphor for life in general, but maybe not taken some time to really sit and think about it. Um, and what it means and how you can actually do this for yourself as a parent, not only as a parent, but also because we're in the midst of uh, another worldwide stress of being a parent in a pandemic. And so when we talk about oxygen, I know it triggers a lot of things about breathing, you know, both being in Colorado where there can be a lot of smoke at times and it's hard to breathe, both the pandemic itself, which is causing respiratory issues. But generally, when we come back to the idea of breathing, it is the very first thing that helps our brains and our nervous system do the work that it needs to do. And so when you think about putting your oxygen mask on first, this can often look like a lot of things. And a lot of what we see out there in the world right now, especially during the pandemic, where there's a lot of advice about self-care and take care of yourself and all this, a lot of times as parents, we go, I don't have time for that. Or self-care looks a lot more pampering than I have the ability, the money, or the time to be able to do. So again, what we're going to try to do today is pare that down and say, what kind of care can you provide for yourself so that you can provide care for others in the best way possible? It might only take three seconds, it might take a minute, but it doesn't have to be something that you're investing tons of time and energy and money into. Um, and so why is it so important to put your oxygen mask on first? Well, one of the things that you're gonna hear me repeat throughout today <laughs> is that when we are activated, in any way, shape, or form, and our emotions are up when we start to think about lots of things, and we're sort of just kind of like that feeling of just whatever stress feels like to us individually in our bodies. When we have activation happening in our nervous system and our brains, we are less likely to be able to process incoming information that comes in, and we are also less likely to be able to produce communication, the kind of information that needs to come out through the logical processing of language or problem solving or decision making. So if you've ever known, like, you know, let's say you get stressed with a kid or kids or you're stressed about something at work or you're stressed with somebody in your, else in your family, a spouse, a partner, anything like that, and you get into a place where you're really heightened I can almost guarantee, because I have experienced it, and everybody I know has experienced this when they really talk about it, we lose the ability to communicate in our main language. We use the ability to communicate in any language whatsoever. We use the, lose the ability to make decisions that we might normally be able to make if we're calmer. We lose the ability to process any kind of incoming information to where that's why arguments escalate because two people, one might be saying something that's fairly clear when I'm calm, but when I'm escalated, I can't process that information. I only see it one way and vice versa. So what we're trying to do is go, okay, well, in order to be able to interact with something that's going to be stressful, parenting being one of them, we have to constantly come back to how do we put our oxygen mask on first? And for parents, it can times feel like, oh, well, that's selfish. I don't, I, I, I'm focused on my kids and my kids only, like they are such wonderful beings and I wanna make sure that they're taken care of. Yes, you do. And the two seconds that it takes to take care of yourself so that you can help them in the best way possible is super, super important. 
And so when we say, what is your oxygen mask and how can you learn to access it? You're going to find out some of these things today, or maybe even just be reminded because some of these things might be things that you've already done in your life in some way, shape or form. Um, the oxygen mask might be, might be going and taking a vacation, but it also might be just stopping and looking at a tree and feeling the bark. <laughs> or it might be holding the hand of your baby and just feeling it for three seconds and letting yourself really be in that sensory place. So a lot of what we're doing today too, we're gonna really be honing in on sensory, present moment sensory, awareness and very, very simple, simple sensory awareness. The thing that our brains often do is we're looking for problem solving um, methods is we're often going above and beyond where our brains actually need to go in order to go into problem solving mode. So we're trying to analyze, 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 and it's actually making things worse and more difficult. And so a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about today are about calming the nervous system so that your brain can process what it needs to process. And so, let's see if I can click forward. There we go. So, I think it's important to recognize that self care looks different in survival mode. So, like I had said before, you may have heard things like, well, go and make yourself a spa day at home, or, you know, even simple things like go watch a movie or go for a walk. Sometimes when we are in a space of true, you know, survival and our, our brains, we might not recognize it. We're not like maybe walking through the woods surviving, but our brains and our nervous system think that we are um, when we are in a heightened uh, state of stress. And so when we're in a heightened state of stress, the nervous system thinks that we are running from a predator or needing to fight something. So that's when we go into that fight or flight mode. And sometimes we can go that just a little bit. And sometimes we might be there a lot. Um, and when we find that we're there a lot, that might be, and this is something I'll talk about at the end too, it might be a good place to sort of um, look into getting some extra support and help so that you can bring down that level of activation. So it's not, you're not just living in fight or flight all the time. And a lot of the people that I work with, whether it's children, teens, or adults, that's where they're coming to me in that, in that place of being like, you know, this is just where I am all the time. So um, when we talk about survival mode, I feel like the whole world is experiencing it on different levels right now. So you've got that level, right? And then underneath that, you've got many varied levels of survival mode that some people deal with on a daily basis, whether it's because of experiences they've had personally in their own family or in just like their, any, any aspect of their life, there's another level. And we're seeing this a lot now where survival mode is something that sort of like runs through the, um, the concept of uh, systemic racism, where somebody is experiencing something like this on a daily basis. And it's just sort of, this is where my level of activation is all the time, because I'm always sort of, it's just what I'm used to. And it's maybe intergenerational. It's what, what people in my family and my gener in generations before me have been used to. And so we've had to kind of move with it. So the survival mode has all these different layers to it. So we can have the basic survival mode of like basic stress that humans experience on a daily basis. Then we've got the layer of being a parent, what we experience on a daily basis as a parent through baby all the way through older, you know, adult children. And then we've got all these other different things that come into our individual and cultural aspects of our lives that cause that kind of constant stress. And then we've got the worldwide pandemic and whatever that means attached to those things. So you can see, even as I'm talking about it, I kind of feel like, oh, that's a lot. Um, and I can feel it in my body where it's kind of like starts to rise a little bit. So what we do in trauma-informed therapy is we are, basically what I find my job is, is I often joke with people that part of my job is to help you learn how to feel bad and be okay with it. <laughs> because we're all gonna feel negative feelings, we're gonna have negative thoughts, we're gonna have negative experiences, but it's being able to not feel like it's taking over your life and be able to do different kinds of practices to be able to turn down the volume 
on the stress, turn down the volume on the negativity to then kind of turn up the volume a little bit on the positive experiences to create a lot more balance and stability. Right now, what I think the whole world is feeling is a lot of instability. And so trauma-informed practices really help with that. And I think that that's why it's really important that we kind of go to those at this time, especially as parents to kind of go, okay, well, how do I find that stability? And even as I'm doing this too, you can notice balance is not one thing just straight all the time balance is always if you looked really closely at scales you would see them kind of moving all the time so there's always a little bit of energy that's being put into creating that balance sometimes more sometimes less so we're drawing on trauma informed practices to understand the need for meeting those basic needs and finding a sense of stability in the midst of survival which again you'll see has maybe just you know a little bit there's only a little, uh, a little bit of energy and effort that you have to put into this to get a lot of return. Oops, we went too far. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so adjusting to those new layers, uh, the varied layers of a new normal. And this is what I was just talking about, grieving the loss of what was known before. So you also may have heard that a lot of what's going on is we, we're grieving and in grieving there's stress because we are trying to adjust to what is different. Um, and again, with all these varied layers, everybody's experience might be different, but we're all experiencing some level of a norm, new normal and a, some level of new stress. So grieving the loss of what was known before, we're grieving the loss of what was known before as our individual self, as individuals in relationship with others in our environment in the greater world as parents, and then as all of these in the midst of an ongoing pandemic, as I had mentioned before. So one of the things that I think is important when we're looking at survival, again, I said we're not obviously in the wilderness, but it feels to our nervous system that we are. So before I became a therapist and went, into, went to grad school and became a private practice therapist years later, um, I actually worked in wilderness um, education and environmental education. So basically I worked at a camp year round. It was a really fun job. One of the things that that really inspired me to do was to go into being a counselor. And, and there were a lot of things that came up in our lessons that I thought were really, really cool. And this is stuff that you can talk to your kids about as well. Um, one of the classes that we taught was called wilderness survival. And so, you know, again, classes would come just as, as they do here. Um, this was something that I did in two different states in Michigan and Ohio. And they would come for maybe three days and do sort of lessons that went along with their lesson plans and stay overnight and have a fun camp experience as well. But a lot of what was coming out of these lessons, I started to realize was a lot deeper <laughs> than just sort of the educational level um, of, learning the facts and understanding it. It was, oh, how does this actually relate to our lives? So now as a therapist and a little bit less than what I did before, but now as a therapist here in Colorado, I am using my training and I actually, I didn't mention this, but the expressive arts therapy training, that was my, my master's training was using art, music, dance, um, movement, um, theater and imagination and bringing all of that into therapy with people. And again, with kids, with teens, and with older adults. It works really well with a lot of things where we don't feel like we have the words to process things sometimes. But the other thing, I started to kind of pull in other modalities, realizing that, you know, being in nature and being in the wilderness and being in that sort of play space and using your senses in the same way that we do in the arts can also really help us find our stability and help create a lot of that balance. And just kind of reconnecting to what's around us can help us with that. So one of the things, just kind of bringing it back to that wilderness survival class that I remembered and that I often bring in is understanding the idea of what we need. What are our basic needs for survival in the wilderness? And when we kind of come to this idea of, you know, feeling stressed and feeling unstable, we're feeling like we're in the wilderness. We are like, where are we? I need to figure out where I'm going, right? But before we get to any of that, we have to make sure we're meeting our basic, basic needs. And so the, the, one of the first lessons we would ask is how long, and this is like the, the rule of threes is what we called it. How long do you think that you would be able to survive in the wilderness without food? And again, these are all very generalized answers because obviously this would be dependent on different individual experiences, but this has been studied and researched and this is what we've come up with. 
is that it would take, um, you could survive in the wilderness without food for about three weeks. And then we move to water. Okay, well, how long do you think you could survive in the wilderness without water? Oh, about three days. Okay, so you really absolutely need water or some sort of um, liquid to kind of replenish. And then we get to what would it take um, if, you, if you didn't have warmth, shelter, or really it's the ability to regulate your body temperature. And the answer to that one was three hours. So we wanna make sure that we have warm clothes. We wanna make sure that we have a proper shelter. We wanna make sure that our temperature is regulated in a way so that we don't um, become sick or um, things start to shut down. And then we move to what, how long would it take, um, you know, how long could you survive without oxygen, without being able to breathe? And the generalized answer, again, this is different for a lot of different people, is about three minutes. And then we go down and we'd say, but there's one more thing that we have to have to survive. Um, and basically, we call that the will to live. Now, you can attach that to anything that kind of you relate to. Um, it might be a sense of hope. It might be something within your own spirituality or religion. It might be just thinking of a family member um, that you really want to live for. It might be a purpose in your life, purpose that you want to live for. And generally what we would say is, well, without that, we would only last about three seconds. Now, again, this is very generalized, but what they have found is that when people are feeling really low on all of these different things, or they're in the wilderness and they don't have these things, the one thing that, that most people have to be able to move forward and find these things is having that hope and that will even just for a split second. And sometimes it can come in an image or it can come in some sort of vision for somebody, but it's just this, this idea that we have that. Now that's not, you know, it might be something that we all have, but we can strengthen it. This, this sense of, uh, of, of purpose to be able to get what we need, right? And so I think that that also requires being able to be practiced at knowing and being, being able to turn down the volume on that activation in the nervous system that, so that we don't go into freeze. So when we are supposed to go into fight or flight, sometimes we feel like we cannot do either. And so we go into a freeze state. And that's often, if you really think about it, so animals go into fight or flight, right? When they are actually being attacked and eaten, and this might seem a little harsh, <laughs> but it's also been shown that they go into a freeze state where everything kind of shuts down so that they are not feeling the amount of pain, the intensity of pain of being eaten by their predator. Um, and I always found that very fascinating because we as humans also have the capacity to get to a place where things can shut down so much that we're not, we're just numb. Um, and what we want to do is strengthen the ability to not have to go into that place and that if we are in fight or flight, we can do things to kind of manage it so that it doesn't go into a freeze state. And so, let's see if we can go to the next slide. There we go. So again, this is what I was talking about before. I'm going ahead of my slides. <laughs> when we are emotionally activated, as you can imagine, I'm talking to people about this a lot lately and trying to talk to myself about it. When we are emotionally activated in any way, our capacity to process logical information, such as language or problem solving, as I told you in the beginning, is often significantly reduced because our brains are receiving signals to move into the survival, fight, flight, or freeze, as I had mentioned, mode. And in order to reduce activation, our nervous systems need to access a sense of safety. So if you think about that word safety, there are many different levels of what that feels like also. If, if our nervous system recognizes that we are not safe in some way, and this can be kind of, um, it can, it, sometimes when we experience a lot of trauma early, our sense of safety can be a little bit off the, the the recognition of what is safe and what isn't because we weren't given a sense of what really is truly safe and what isn't. So that's why a lot of times people come to therapy or do the kind of um, healing work that allows them to regain a sense of, well, what is safety and how do I feel that in my body? So in order to reduce that activation, our nervous systems actually need to access a sense of safety and that safety is going to allow us to be stable enough to be able to meet whatever else is coming at us so that we can really approach it in the most effective way. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay. 
There we go. So we're going to do some experiential things today. And again, I don't have people being able to kind of respond back to me, but we can talk about it at the end to kind of process it. I've always, you know, from my time being an experiential educator at a camp in the outdoors to then doing expressive arts therapy to then pulling in nature-based therapy where I take people outside and do this kind of stuff outside. Um, I've always really found that, at least for me, learning experientially is where it really sticks. So meaning that I'm going to experience this, I'm not just going to talk at you for the rest of this <laughs> rest of this time and allow you the chance to kind of practice some of these things and maybe find um, other spaces and places where you can continue to practice these things. So quick stress buster tools, part one, simple sensory awareness. The word simple sensory awareness together is something that I utter almost daily when I am working with people and I find that it helps reduce this feeling of like, I have to work so hard to connect with the present moment. It's something that is very simple. It might not feel simple at certain times, but we have to break it down into simplicity so that when we are at our most stressed, we know that we don't have to, you know, do the quote unquote regular coping skills. Like I, may, I can't even reach for the phone right now. So what do I do before that? I can't even stand up and get out of my bed. So what do I do before that? Um, and so this kind of practice allows us to get into that. So it's basically some of these exercises I'm going to um, describe and invite you to try are using one or more of the five senses to discover what is actually happening in this present moment outside of our own thoughts and emotions and thoughts and emotions about the past or the future. So usually when we're kind of off, I kind of call it an out of body experience. When we get caught up in our thoughts or our emotions, it's usually about something that's about the past or something about the future. It could be a response to something that's happening in the present moment. But when we go into just our pure, simple sensory awareness, we're letting ourselves separate. We're not pushing away thoughts and getting rid of them or avoiding them in some way. We're just noting them and then coming back to what, what am I seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, tasting, all of that. And so, We'll start with a couple of exercises that I use a lot with my clients. Um, and I also have found, you know, these work with, with I work with a lot of adults and teens. Um, I started out working with a lot of kids and now I find that a lot of what I did with kids transfers very well into working with adults, which is why I love that you all come here today because these are things that I, as a parent, I can use and kind of teach my kids. But I also find that there are multiple times in ways that these have helped me um, to be able to, again, put on my oxygen mask on first. So you can do this for yourself and then you can work with your kids to find ways that these kind of exercises work with them. And there's actually a lot of things out there that I'll talk about later that help you be able to translate this into something that you can help your kids with. So when focusing on our breathing is too difficult at first, trying simple tools for shifting from doing mode into being mode is really helpful. So a lot of times when you'll hear in therapy or in the therapy world, or you might hear in, again, the self-care, self-help world, well, the first thing you need to do is breathe. Or somebody will come to you and say, oh my gosh, you're panicking, breathe, breathe, breathe. Well, as somebody who's experienced anxiety and panic, and maybe you have yourself, or maybe you recognize this in your child, sometimes when you say that first, <laughs> sometimes, um, and I would venture to say for some people it's often, it actually makes people feel more anxious. So we, it's not that we don't want to focus on breathing, it's just that that might not be the first thing that we go to immediately when somebody's feeling stressed. And it might you might not see the outward stress as much to be able to say that. But a lot of these things are allowing us to get to a place where then we can kind of turn in and focus on our breathing. And sometimes it actually means because the body is not feeling safe, it means being able to connect with, and a lot of times I'll say ground in what's happening through your senses outside of your body right now, because that's sort of where, in some way where we're, we're able to find a little more safety before we can go inward. And with some clients, I'll be working on this stuff for a long time before we'll go into recognizing what's happening in the body. Because the body, for a lot of people, for lots of different experiences, has not been a safe place to be. So we have to kind of find our sta stability outside and then go in. So the first, um, the first exercise I'm going to invite you to try, in, and I'll give you some examples while I'm doing it, 
is um, just a very basic, simple sensory thing to kind of ground yourself into one thing in the present moment that's either pleasant or neutral. So you are invited right now to just wherever you are, maybe you're outside, maybe you're in your car, maybe you're in your house, maybe you're in an office, just pausing for a minute to just use your visual sense. And again, I'm, I'm assuming, which I know I shouldn't do, but that most people who are coming on to here have the ability to use their sight. Now I know there's different levels of um, visual sense. So this may not be the strongest one, which is why I'm gonna be using some other things too. But a lot of times when we go to visual sense first, that can be a place of safety for somebody. We'll also go into using, okay, we can do this in a tactile way as well. So if, if visual is not your first and most primary place of like, okay, this helps me feel stable, then you can use tactile sense as well. So either looking around and connecting with something neutral or pleasant, um, some neutral pleasant sensory information in the present moment, or tactilely. So one of the ways is I might just kind of scan around, moving my head around the room a little bit until my eyes land on something that feels neutral or pleasant. And so I've landed on something. And then the next step basically is to, you know, either tell somebody near you what you're seeing and describing it in a really concrete way. So what I'm seeing that you can't see is a painting of some of a rock cairn. It's like a stacked rocks on top of each other with some soft kind of colors. And I'm just noticing that the background feels like, you know, it's it's got some yellows and it's got some greens in it. And then I go to the rocks themselves. They've got a kind of a nice like round shape that kind of, it feels calming to me. And so I'm noticing a, a sense of pleasantness. Um, for some of these things, you might look around and go, okay, well, I can't find anything pleasant, so what about neutral? Okay, well, that wall feels pretty neutral to me. It's just sort of a tan color and flat and smooth. So that's visually, we're, we're doing that first step. If, if you're using your tactile sense, you could, and this actually has happened when I've felt more anxious, is just letting yourself feel what your feet feel like in your shoes on the ground or using your hands to feel, I'm feeling a smooth table. And then I'm describing to myself or to somebody else, oh, that table, what does it feel like? It feels smooth. It feels a little bit cool, but not too much. It's kind of a neutral feeling. I'm just letting my hands kind of sink into that feeling. And then the next step, like I was just saying, is letting yourself just be there for a few seconds. You might, it might lead you to being there for a few seconds to a couple of minutes but it's just allowing yourself to do something that simple and looking at it and maybe both of them. So I'm feeling the table and I'm looking at this painting, letting myself just pause for a minute and just take it in. It's almost like you're just sort of like taking a vacation into it, but still it's a vacation into something that is happening in this present moment. You might notice maybe after a few moments that your breathing starts to deepen and slow down on its own. You might notice that something that felt tense before kind of slows down. I'm noticing that my shoulders kind of paused and dropped a little bit. I'm noticing that I can feel my body sitting here in this present moment a little bit more when I'm doing this. I'm not caught up in what the next thing is and what I need to say and how somebody's gonna perceive it. I'm just noting, oh, it's just a painting. Oh, it's just a feeling. Oh, it just feels smooth. So that is one example. And again, I would stay with this a little bit longer if I was doing this with somebody. One example of something you can do in those moments to just sort of turn down the distress or the stress you're feeling. So it's actually um, can be considered what in dialectical behavioral therapy calls a distress tolerance skill, but it's combined with core mindfulness, just sort of what's happening in this present moment, non-judgmentally, just Oh, it's just smooth. I mean, that you could see that as a judgment, I guess, but it's just turning down the volume on having to use your logical problem solving so much and just going into your senses. So the next exercise that I think is sort of builds on that is called the 54321 exercise. And this is something that, again, if you've experienced any kind of therapy, you may have done this already. Um, this is something that comes from, I don't know where, but it's been passed around a lot these days. Um, and basically, you're doing a very similar exercise to what we just did, but you're going through each of your senses. 
So you're just being really simple about, again, there's no other motivation other than to just notice things, note something about them through your senses, and then move on. So we're just sort of going, and you can have somebody else help you with this too. I've had, you know, teens help each other, or a parent helping a child do this, or a spouse helping another spouse do this. But you can also do this for yourself. Maybe you have it written down somewhere. There's a lot of printouts online that you can print this out and put this up somewhere to remind yourself. But it's, it's helpful to kind of maybe even think of the hand. So we go, you know, five, four, three, two, one. And again, I when I started doing this exercise, I would mix around the senses. It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you're sort of kind of just systematically going through it. So we're just gonna notice five things in your present moment environment that you can see. And you're gonna make note of them. Again, you can use a journal to do this. You can just say it out loud. You can just say it to yourself. Five things, different things that you can see. So I'm gonna go around and, and, and you can describe things about them. Oh, I see a yellow Lego in this box. And the next thing I see is a purple folder, light purple. And then a third thing that I see is a tree branch on the wall. I should probably show you guys so that you're not like, what the heck? Okay, so that's in my office. <laughs> and I see lines and different kinds of shapes inside of the tree branches. Um, another thing I see is a light over here in the corner. It's kind of soft, but I kind of can still see the light. It's a little orangey, a little bit of a pink in it. And then the fifth thing that I can see, I think I'm on five, is a tea kettle in the corner. It's got like a cork handle and it's black and smooth. So then once we've done those five things, then we move on to four things that we can feel. So again, visual and tactile sense are usually the ones that we can see and feel the most. So that's why it's kind of structured in this way. So four things I can feel. And I might say again, the table, oh, it feels smooth. Um, uh, the computer, oh, it feels a little bit warmer. I'm feeling the laptop, this part right here. Okay, let me just feel that. Okay, so then two more things. Oh, I can feel this book. I, I feel the pages, oh, that feels smooth. And then a fourth thing is, um, I don't know, I feel my, my sweater that I'm wearing right now. That feels a little bit smooth right here. So again, we're, we're running through these different things and just going, okay, five things you can see, four things that you can feel, three separate sounds that you can hear. And this sometimes, again, it might be difficult, but that's why there's only three. I can hear the whirring of the fan on my computer. I can hear some outside sounds kind of going in and coming out. I can hear the sound of my own voice. Then two things you can smell. Sometimes it's, I have to look for something to smell. I can smell, my jacket feels a little, smells a little bit different than just the air. Sometimes it's just, oh, I can just feel the sensation of the air coming in through my nose as I breathe in. This is also a nice little trick because when you, pause and notice two things you can smell, you're actually pausing to take in a breath <laughs> and then letting it out. And then one thing you can taste, and I always tell people it's okay if, it, if all of these things, they don't have to be pleasant. Um, they can be neutral or unpleasant. So mm, tasting maybe just a really neutral kind of saliva taste in my mouth. But again, something that we don't pay as much attention to all the time. And one thing you can notice about the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 exercise is that when we do this, it actually stretches out the amount of time that we're giving to ourselves to pause and use our sensory awareness to be in the present moment. You might get distracted by thoughts or other things kind of pulling you away while you're doing it, but you can always come back to it. And sometimes people practice this exercise and they say, well, I only got to 5 and 4, but then I felt a little better. So, okay, I moved on to the next thing. That's fine too. It's just a way of sort of stretching out the, uh, the ability to kind of be in that present moment. So now another thing that you can think about is um, just the idea of shifting perspective. So this also helps with a sensory present moment. We've done a little bit of this when we did the, the exercises that we just did. But shifting perspective outdoors, indoors, or in the midst of any activity. So what shifting your perspective does is it tells our brain and nervous system that something else is happening besides what is unpleasant. Always. So this is why I tell people just turning your head or shifting your body position. So if you're in a really deep depressed state and you're able to just kind of like turn your eyes 
or turn your head. And again, this can take practice so that before we get into a depressed state, we're able to recall it and remember to do it. That's why we practice these things when we're feeling a little bit less activated so that the brain can process it and understand it even more. But even as you do this experientially, your brain takes it in even more than if we were just talking about it. So if you just take a moment to notice, okay, I'm looking at a computer screen. Now, if I turn my head and look this way, oh yeah, it tells my brain that something else is happening. And then if I shift my body position, if I stretch, oh, I didn't realize that I was sitting kind of scrunched. So maybe my body needs to kind of just move a little bit and shift. Um, the other thing is that you can do just as a specific exercise to help with perspective and help your nervous system understand shifting perspective are actually play-based type of things that I think all adults have the ability to do just as much as kids, but you can do this with your kids. So it's about uh, different kinds of ways of seeing or taking in the world. So with a keyhole perspective, you might stop and go, okay, well, I'm seeing all the stuff around me. What if I just did this? and put my hands in a shape where I'm just looking through them and just paying attention to what I see within that little space. You know, you might even wanna do different shapes. Maybe you can make a heart and sort of then again, see what do I see just within that space? And I look down. Um, if you move into an upside down perspective, this can be rather fun. <laughs> and you're basically just like either standing up and turning upside down and looking at what you see. So again, it tells the brain and the nervous system, ooh, that's different. Um, and it sort of shifts the perspective of everything sort of feeling um, only one way. Um, or you could be lying down and kind of looking up and noticing what does it look like upside down. Um, widening your perspective just is the, uh, you know, so standing up. And again, you can do this anywhere. Outside of nature is a really nice place to do it. But just putting your hands, well, I can't really, can't really see it, but putting your hands all the way out and then peripherally noticing like, okay, how much can I take in from the edge of where my hands are on either side? So that widened perspective from here to here and just that. Um, you can also do, you know, again, with the keyhole perspective, you can do different things like, you know, the way that artists do where you are looking at something just through a box or something like that but also doing something that's just sort of like, okay, what's within this little box right here? What's within this little box right here? And then the last thing I have on here is, is called box walking. It's something that I derived from a wilderness therapy training, um, which I think is kind of fun. And again, it's fun with kids, but it's also something that can help us shift our perspective is understanding, okay, well, a lot of the sensory stuff, this is what animals do anyway. So if we think about a fox and how it walks when it's kind of you know looking for prey, there is a specific way that it's walking that's very, it's, it's a sensory way. So it's sort of like, you know, walking with your sort of heel to the, to the toe, heel to the toe, and slowly putting down your feet and kind of noticing what that feels like. You can also shift that perspective and start from toe to heel and move the other way. I might be getting this wrong scientifically. I don't know if foxes walk one way or the other, but basically the idea is that you are slowing down your awareness of what your feet do or what they may do all the time. <clears throat> and again, this also um, assumes um, uh, accessibility to being able to use your feet in that way. There are all different ways that this can be modified. If somebody is in a wheelchair and they can't use their feet, um, they can use other senses that might be stronger for them to be able to shift their perspective. Um, and I should say that I've actually worked with people in those situations too. There's a whole faction of people who I work with who have um, physical um, and developmental disabilities, and we've been able to do a lot of these things as well. So we're talking a lot about mindfulness. It's paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's a quote that comes from John Kabat-Zinn, who has been a researcher at UMass Medical School. Um, he did a lot of research starting in the 70s with a lot of different people that basically brought the idea of meditation into the medical world. And they were able to use the languaging of, you know, the language of neuroscience and medical language to sort of just basically transfer what's already been done in spiritual practices and um, cultural practices all over the world for billions of years into a place where now they're writing books about it and saying, oh, look, an MRI says that this helps change your brain <laughs> so that people can bring this more in the medical field and 
notice ways that this can help change and shift our perspective on chronic pain and illness, on depression, anxiety, trauma, PTSD, um, all of it. And now, checking my time here. Okay, so another um, way of being able to do this kind of mindful practice is using um, things that really kind of go into the breath. Um, and so we've, we've shifted from, okay, well, we're grounded enough to be able to go into the breath and do something with the breath. So one of the things that you may have heard or maybe practiced before, but is used very often is something called rock, box breathing or square breathing. And the basic gist is just what it says here. It's just um, a slow exhale. So I always say, okay, let, the, let your belly kind of soften and let it out so that you can have space to breathe back in again. Because a lot of times when somebody tells you to breathe, the first thing we try to do is our breath is already being held in and we try to breathe. And it can cause almost like a hyperventilation response. So in order to fully breathe, sometimes when we're in that heightened state, we have to let it out. So we almost have to drop in and let our body kind of drop as much as possible. Let let the belly kind of come out a little bit so that it can have enough space to slowly inhale for four counts. So you're breathing in, two, three, four, lightly hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, lightly hold, two, three, four. And so they call it box breathing because it's four, right? So it's like, you know, four seconds in, four seconds hold, four, four counts exhale, and then four counts lightly hold again. And you can do this as much as you need to, but it's just let it out, inhale, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four. And I, I notice even when I do that, especially in the midst of talking and doing a presentation, might be really slight, but for me, it just like, whew, everything just sort of dropped. So then the next thing that I do a lot with people is a guided body scan. And this is something that you can find on all different kinds of websites, um, different kinds of apps. I have a link to something called Headspace at the end that does a lot of wonderful guided meditations. And a lot of those meditations involve a body scan or some part of a body scan. Um, but if you have questions about that, you can always email me and I can give you suggestions for places where you can look for that. I do guided body scans with people all the time. I just sort of do them off the top of my head. So we're not going to get totally into that today, but just letting yourself sort of start by when, when we do a body scan, it's just starting again by noticing that sensory awareness. So starting by noticing your body just sitting here, the simple, simple aspect of just, you're just a human body sitting here breathing. And you can notice the points of contact. Maybe you can feel your leg against the chair, or your back against the chair where you're sitting, or maybe your feet and your shoes on the ground. And you can pause and you can even use box breathing at the beginning of a body scan just to kind of note, okay, am I breathing or am I holding in my breath? A lot of times when I'm doing a guided body scan, I actually start with the feet. I don't start with the breath. So I just start with, okay, the whole body's sitting here and then we move to the feet. Let's feel what the feet feel like in this moment. Do they feel cold? Do they feel hot? Does one feel different than the other? Are they cramping up? Are they relaxed? Is one different than another? Then you move up to the ankles, the bottom half of the legs, the knees, top half of the legs, the lower part of the body. And then when we get to the lower part of the body, that's often when I pause with people to say, here's a place where you can start to recognize, is your breathing held in? Is it slow? Whatever it is, we're just allowing it for a moment. And then if it is held in, we can let it out a little bit so that we can breathe back in again and just play with feeling what that feels like. And then we move up through all the different parts of the body, everywhere through these different uh, parts of the body, the torso, the back, the shoulders, the arms, the hands, the fingers, then moving up into the neck, the throat, the back of the head, the top of the head, the forehead, and then all the muscles in the face, the eyes, the nose. This is another good place to notice breathing. There's a different temperature when the air comes in through your nose versus when it comes out. So it's a nice thing to kind of have a sensory awareness of. Then we move into the lips, teeth, and tongue, just kind of noticing your own sensory awareness of what's happening. Jaw, jaw muscles. This can also be a place if you hold any tension to just kind of give yourself a little massage or 
let your jaw drop a little bit and notice the difference that happens when that happens. Moving into your chin, going up and noticing your ears, kind of like, oh, does one feel, ear feel versus the other? And then layering on different kinds of sensory awareness. So from just the tactile sense, then we're starting to notice sounds. Then we're opening up to noticing what we see outside. So it's kind of moving a little bit backwards from what we did before. <clears throat> but it's another way of really gaining sense of, oh, okay, I'm in this present moment. Now, as I have written up here, and I gotta move this around so I can see it, there we go. So we start by noticing your whole body sitting here in this present moment, simply breathing. Anytime you find the mind getting distracted from the focus on the body and the breath in the body, especially if somebody's guiding you, totally okay. Once you notice it, I've heard from some mindfulness practitioners, it's a time to congratulate yourself for noticing, saying, yay, I caught myself, I'm coming back to the present moment, rather than, oh no, I'm doing it wrong. Oh, I, I missed everything that the, 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 the guided meditation was saying. It absolutely doesn't matter. The point of meditation is more about returning again and again and again to the present moment, which some days you might have to do it a million times, and some days you might be able to stay there a little bit longer. It's just a way of checking in with what you need, and then giving yourself a little bit of what you need. So when you catch yourself kind of going off on a thought stream rather than being in your body, you can just congratulate yourself for noticing and return to that present moment awareness again. This is, again, more about returning to the awareness of the present rather than trying, trying, trying to relax because we're, again, we're letting ourselves be in being mode where we don't have to try so hard, which I know that sometimes as parents, when we hear, you don't have to try so hard, it just, it, it can kind of like, well, it can trigger us, but it can also kind of melt us into like, oh, thank you. Thank you. I don't want to have to, I feel like I'm trying so hard all the time. So instead of trying so hard to relax, this comes up when people talk about sleeping too, trying so hard to sleep, trying so hard to relax usually doesn't work. What we have to do is recognize what's happening, have an acceptance of what's happening in the present moment. And then eventually with time, we will our, our body will just kind of come to a natural state of rest and relaxation. Okay, I'm gonna click on the next slide, see if it does anything, there we go. So stress, quick stress buster tools part two. I'm gonna move a little bit more um, quickly through some of these um, because some of these are things that you might experience again if you're going to meet with a therapist yourself or be part of a therapy group. Um, but I'll just give you a kind of overview of, of how I use them. And then again, if you have more questions on how to do it more specifically, or if you want to um, get a little bit more direction on how to do it, I'm happy to do this. Actually, I'm going to ask the moderator <laughs> how much time I actually have, because I know we're going until 1.30, but I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions and everything. I don't know if you can hear me. Well, I'll just keep moving. <laughs> All right, well, I'll keep on moving because I know we have until 1.30. I'm just not sure if, um, uh, if we have time for doing all of the exercises, but I'll just keep moving until somebody tells me otherwise. <laughs> um, so Quiz Stress Buster Tools Part 2 is using imagination to manage overwhelm. So. I, again, like I said, my training is using experiential um, expressive arts therapy. Um, every single thing that I do often uses imagination and play. And again, this is something that I use a lot with adults, not just with kids, because when adults go into more of a play space and an imagination space, it kind of, again, it takes us away from that adult thinking, thinking, thinking mode, and doing, doing, doing mode. And it just allows us to be in that play space that sometimes we're not giving ourselves um, permission to be in. Um, so I'm going to move forward with this. So these, some of these exercises actually come from um, trauma-informed evidence-based practices that are uh, used to address trauma. And I find that they can work for just about anybody in many different situations, even if you're not feeling like you're experiencing specific trauma. And again, like I said, we're all experiencing some level of it right now, which is why I've noticed that some people who've been in therapy before, uh, when the pandemic started, they were like, oh, 
I kind of feel like I have a little bit more of a handle on this than some people who haven't had to deal with a, you know, a specific trauma or anxiety um, because they've learned some of these tools. And so some of these can really help us both again as individuals, but also um, as parents and just as a collective. So um, one thing, and I found that I've been using this a lot lately with people, is something called the container exercise. And this is something that I think helps with overwhelm because a lot of times we feel like there's just thoughts and emotions and physical sensations and memories and stuff just spilling all over the place. It can be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, but it just feels overwhelming because there's too much. You know, sometimes you can go and say, okay, well, I'm going to write myself a list and I'm going to put it down. But sometimes it can be too much and sort of like too many layers to be able to list. And some of the stuff that's also in there is stuff that we can't even put words to. So we have a hard time because it's maybe just a feeling or it's a, a fuzzy memory of something that's been bothering us and we can't really um, approach it or put words to it. And so this allows us to do something with our imagination that allows some containment to where we're not, you know, trying so hard to push it away or avoid it or get rid of it or um, try and fix it in the moment. But we're saying, okay, I'm going to place this over here. I'm going to organize it and I will get to it. I'll kind of get to it in a one at a time fashion. Um, and we use this in therapy, especially when we're doing trauma work, because there's a lot of stuff that can just sort of pop up. And we want to make sure that after a therapy session, it's not just spilling out all over the place and getting in our way. Um, so with the container exercise, with your imagination, and you can try this right now if you like, if it feels like it's going to be helpful for you, just identifying and describing um, the details of a container that you feel would safely hold distressing thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. And also, you know, distressing memories. So there might be things that are, you know, distressing memories, or there might be things that you're sort of like anticipating with anxiety. Those are things that we can also put into this container. So the first part of it's kind of fun, and you can use this, I've done this with art making with people. Um, you can do this while journaling, or you can just do it in your imagination if you feel like, oh, I don't really want to go there. That feels too stressful. <laughs> but it's just imagining a container that can safely hold all of these things. Now, some people come up with something that they've seen in the world, like a jar or a trunk, um, or something that they have in their possession. Usually, I try to steer people into something that's a little more imaginative, so they don't feel so attached to the thing that sometimes has emotional attachments to it. But we're just imagining this container. It could be big, it could be small, it absolutely doesn't matter. It's just whatever you feel like, oh, that feels safe. And maybe we feel like there's a certain kind of latch or locking mechanism on it that when we close it up, we can feel like it's even safer. Um, it can be something that is completely imaginary, like something kind of sci-fi. The one that I've come up with for myself is a little bit sci-fi. <laughs> it's like a a round sort of oblong egg kind of thing that's really tough metal and when you close it the opening seals up so that nobody else can open it and know how to open it but me <laughs> and so again you can go anywhere with this from something that's really concrete people have said things about like um, specifically ball jars tend to come up a lot um, because those tend to feel like they're very secure um, sometimes trunks things like that so what you're going to do is just with your imagination, identify and describe the details for yourself of a container that you would feel safely um, hold, it can hold distressing thoughts, emotions, physical sensations, distressing memories, things like that. And then one by one, what we do is we take, using our imagination, we imagine ourselves physically placing those different things into the container. And we want to kind of slow down this process because there is an aspect of this, this is the secret I'm going to tell you, the aspect of this is the empowering feeling of you have control over this in your imagination to place this in here just a little bit. Um, shifts the mind's perspective again to being able to say, okay, don't have to deal with all of this right now. It's there, I can go into it when I need to. It might try to bust its way out and pop out, but it's, I can put it back in, right? Kind of like the thoughts, it's like just noting them and putting them back in. So you can do this as a meditation as well. And so there's a lot of different suggestions for, well, how do I put those things in there? If it's something that feels like a picture, that's a still picture, you could imagine shrinking the picture down. You could imagine you have a special remote control that takes the color out of the picture if there's color in it. 
um, you can imagine um, folding it up and putting it in there so that it fits. You could imagine if it's words that keep popping up, you can imagine writing it down on a piece of paper in invisible ink, folding that up, putting that in there and putting it away. And if it is something that is like a sort of abstract thing, like a smell or a, uh, just like a fuzzy color of something that just feels not great to you, you can kind of imagine kind of like putting that into a little vial or something and closing it up, putting it away in there. If it's a sound, similarly, you can imagine recording it on a CD or a DVD uh, or a thumb drive, or just sort of like taking the sound and putting it in there. If it is um, a, a moving picture, similarly, you can imagine pausing the moving picture shrinking it down, taking color out, anything, taking the, the volume out of it, um, muting it, and then being able to put it in the container. So you're just imagining all of these different things. Now, um, this actually came up recently with a client where they were like, yeah, but I have all these sort of like also priorities that are happening. And if I put them away, then I'm going to forget them. It, not necessarily. It just will decrease the amount of stress that you have about these different things. And this is why sometimes people like to write them down or draw it out while they're doing it. Um, but I, I've often said, okay, maybe what's happening is you're having a stressful day and in order to prioritize things, we just need to go, okay, I'm just doing this container exercise for the moment. I can always open it back up and take something out in five minutes, or I can put something else in there for a time being and then take something else out. So it's just this physical, um, imagining of placing these things in there. And then once you've gotten everything in there, it's just imagining closing it up, locking it up, making it as secure as possible. And then when you feel like everything is safely in there, the next thing I will say is, okay, well, just let me know, because I'm not going to be able to know exactly when you're done. It might take three seconds. It might take five minutes. It might take an hour to do this exercise with yourself until you feel like, okay. Usually people say, oh, I feel a sense of activation has turned down or I feel like I'm here, or I, I feel like I'm, I have more energy, or I feel a little bit clearer now that I've done that. And you can decide, you know, do, is that something that you wanna feel like imaginally carrying around with you so that you can put things in it throughout the day? Or is it something you wanna put on somebody's shelf? Often as a therapist, I say, you can leave it here with me until the next time you come to therapy. And we will definitely be able to address it, and I'll remind you, but you're the only one who can actually open and close this container. So again, that's another way of being able to use, that's one way of being able to use your imagination to contain things. So the calm place exercise is just one of these uh, sort of like going to your happy place kind of exercises. Um, yet the extra step is not just, hey, go to your happy place, think of something that makes you happy. It's moving from thinking into feeling with your senses. So you can do this again with art, with journaling, with writing, or you can do this by talking through it with somebody, or you can just do it in your own imagination, in your mind. And what we're doing is we're describing a place, real or imaginary. We've gone everywhere from like a place I've been on vacation to um, a place up in the sky with rainbows and unicorns. It absolutely doesn't matter. It's something that makes you feel um, calm. It brings you peace and brings you some sort of sense of stability, which again, you can check in periodically with yourself and notice the calm happening in your muscles relaxing, in the activation level moving down, and maybe a cloud lifting, feeling clarity. So you're basically thinking of a place, real or imaginary, that brings you peace, calm, and stability, and moving through the five senses to describe each aspect in detail. So, you know, colors, shapes, who's, who's in the scene with you? Is there anybody or is there nobody in the scene? Are they animals, plants? describing them in as much detail as possible and then going through you know what do you see what do you hear in this place what do you feel in this place what does the temperature of the air feel like is it night is it day um, and you know what do you smell maybe is there something that you smell or taste in this space our memory for senses is really kind of great especially in our imagination for senses can be really cool that i'm always surprised when i'm like oh if i imagine tasting you know, this thing that I really, really love, I can actually, if I sit there for a moment, I can actually taste it. Brain is pretty amazing. <laughs> and so what we're doing is doing that kind of calm place exercise through your senses, through the use of your senses in an imaginary way to gain a sense of just sort of calm and being able to reduce overwhelm. So as I mentioned on the bottom, these can be used with or without art and our craft materials. Incorporating the use of art materials within the creative process can allow for increased present moment sensory awareness. A lot of times when I'm doing 
art with people, and especially even when I'm doing telehealth with people, we can still do it. We're able to, when we're using a marker or a crayon or a paintbrush, feel the paper, hear the sound of the paintbrush on the paper. So we're really kind of still focusing on the sensory awareness of it. Almost as if we would when we were a little child before we had all of these thoughts attached to all this stuff. So now we get to quick stress buster number three, part three, um, using imagination to re regulate vulnerable emotional states. And this is also where I'm gonna kind of move more quickly through this, partially because of time, but also because this is something that I think is helpful to have um, a trained professional working with you on. Um, but it, you know, if you're not in a place where you feel particularly stressed, this can be a, a fun thing to kind of play around with and also potentially with your children as well. Um, so the first exercise is attending to the child self and importing support. And there are a multitude of ways that we can do this. The idea of importing imaginal support into maybe a memory of ourself as a child that we have where we didn't have the support we needed in order to meet our, our needs at that moment. And again, this is why this is something that I think often a trained professional can help you with because this can get a little bit, um, we can start to feel unsteady when these kinds of things come up, depending on what's ha happened in our childhood and our life. So it's just basically using that exercise to attend to what your child self would need when you're experiencing vulnerability or distress. Um, and that we think about these simple common child needs, right? A hug, play, I want to nap, I need space, I need love and kindness, I need to move, I need laughter. So really what, what this helps with when we're importing that kind of support. So it might be a wise figure that comes in and brings it to us. It might be imagining that there is something abstract, like a color of something comes in and it gives us a hug that we need. And again, it's not negating what happened in your past when you're thinking of those kinds of things. It's just attending to the child self. So a lot of times when we talk about vulnerability or stress, when the activation of fight or flight comes in, it's often hearkening back to, it's, it's re responding and reacting to what we experienced first and learned first as a child. And so sometimes the need to help us calm down in that moment might not have been fully met for all of us, no matter whether we grew up in a wonderful household with very caring parents and family or, or there were other things going on. There are often times where our emotions will rise up and we will later go, oh my God, I just had a tantrum, right? I've had these happen specifically while remote learning is happening. <laughs> Maybe some of you have as well, but where we have to pause and go, oh, wait a minute. I don't need to change what's happening in front of me. I don't need to change the kid. I don't need to do something to fix this. I need to attend to something that's happening in me first. So this is putting your oxygen mask on first, right? Maybe I need to do something that feels like a hug. It doesn't mean actually giving yourself a hug or getting a hug sometimes. Sometimes it might be like, oh, I need to put my hands in warm water or something like that. Um, maybe play means I just need to, or play and laughter means I just need to look at something funny and laugh about it and be intentional about it, right, for a moment. Oh, my child just really needs this. And so in order for the child to calm down enough for the adult to kind of come in and balance out with it, Sometimes we need to do that. And in, in these importing support exercises, a lot of times I'll just go through that imaginal exercise of imagine yourself when you're noticing, you know, the child self come in and, you know, if you feel this tight sense, when's the earliest time that you can remember feeling that? Start to notice the imagery that comes up and they might say, oh, it was me at five years old and here I am and I'm on the floor and I'm crying. And so we're imagining, oh, what would you have liked? You know, even if this is, this is not changing the past, it's just attending to the present moment need of the vulnerability that's happening in us. So it might be bringing in a special um, something or other or a wise figure to kind of calm us down with words or with actions. Um, or it might be then re recognizing, okay, this reminds me of what I need to be doing more for myself outside of my imagination in order to attend to this part of myself. And then the next um, uh, exercise is letting go of what is not yours. So this is a boundary setting exercise. Imagining something or someone holding it for you or giving it back to someone who's actually responsible for it. So a lot of times this happens when we're in interactions with somebody, um, specifically other adults, whether it's at work or it's our family or friends or whatever it is. And when you can not actually physically say, here, 
take that back. You're being annoying. <laughs> like, don't, you know, it might not help for you to say it to that person. You're using an imagination exercise within yourself. And again, this is practicing this even before so that maybe it just happens more quickly when you're in the moment of like, whoa, I just got, you know, some stuff got dumped on me that's not mine. Um, it might be something that you even see in the news that you get caught up in, or it might be something that you've heard about or read about. And we have to stop and go, wait a minute, is that mine to be responsible for? I don't think that's mine to be responsible for. This also can happen sometimes with children. We're not going to physically go to kids and say, hey, take that back. You just dumped something on me. I mean, there's different ways to be able to language that with kids, but we might have to start to notice things like, and I'll just give you an example. I'm noticing that uh, sometimes I would be sort of in an interaction with like, maybe it's a, a teacher, an administrator, or it's, it's like I'm feeling their stuff. And it's not anything that's wrong with anybody. We're all dealing with stuff right now. But in my mind, in order for me to calm down and be able to communicate what I need to communicate, I need to not get so caught up in what that other person is feeling. And so in order to do that, I can do an imaginary exercise where maybe I'm imagining the stuff that they handed to me was a basket of things. And I'm imagining physically handing it gently back, stepping away and noticing the space that it feels that you start to feel when you go, okay, that wasn't mine to, to be responsible for. So um, again, there's a lot of different ways that we can do these kinds of things, um, but these are just a few examples. And one of the things that came up for me while I was putting this presentation together was a song that I actually, um, I, I linked it here, so I, you might have to put it into a thing and look for it. Um, it's a song that's based on um, a, a verse from uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. I did not spell that right. I apologize, Khalil Gibran. I need to redo that. His name is Khalil Gibran. And um, the passage is called On Children. And a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock, which is um, uh, an a cappella group um, of African American women, amazing, one of my favorite. But we used to, so I did a lot of singing in college and we did um, a lot of their songs. And it, it didn't really, really hit me, the lyrics, until more recently of a song that we had sung a lot called On Children from this thing from The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Um, one of the, one of the asp one of the lyrics that comes out of that is you can strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. And it's, it starts out with your children are not your children. They are the sons and the daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. And it talks a lot about even our interactions with our children now, like even when I start to say my son, <laughs> or my child. Sometimes that languaging can even wrap us up in feeling like we are so fully responsible and we want to mold and shape everything, right? This is that's coming from a really good place. But it can also edge into wanting to um, either control what's going on when it's not going the way that we feel like would be the most healthy for them, or it might mean that we are getting very, very activated. And maybe both of those things often happen at the same time. And what we have to sort of do is sort of pull back and go, this is a separate person with a separate brain. Yes, maybe they came from me, or maybe I adopted them and I've done a lot of shaping. But it is being able to separate yourself from them and going, they're a separate person from me and they're going to have all these experiences and I can give them as much as I can and I can help them with as much as I can but ultimately they're going to be walking that path with themselves. And so I think that these lyrics really speak to this idea of what's happening a lot, especially during this pandemic and especially with the way education is going right now. Um, we can tend to either have a perfectionistic attitude toward wanting our kids to like complete everything. I know that I've experienced that and I had to go, wait a minute, this is my stuff. He doesn't do things the same way I do. And, or we may have not done well in school and we want our kids to do better than we did. And so we are striving to get them to be like a certain thing that we wanted to be when really a lot of this is coming back and going, oh, this is my own stuff. I have to take care of myself first and I have to be able to process what's happening with myself so that I can allow them with all the suggestions that I'm making to synthesize it and do what they need to do in the world. And as I'm saying this, 
please know, like I said in the beginning, I have to remind myself to do this every single moment of the day with my own child. <laughs> it's a lot harder to be a parent of a child than it was for me to just be a therapist of a child who goes away or a teacher, you know, it's, it's still hard, but there's something a little bit different because we get very wrapped up in the connection, forgetting that we need to separate ourselves from the child themselves and the beautiful child that they are. So the last thing that I have, last couple things I have in here is this, just a resource list. Um, this is, you know, books, articles, podcasts, websites, different things that you can go to, to be able to kind of like, you know, learn some more about some of the things that we talked about today. Um, there's a wonderful article on here called Your Surge Capacity is Depleted. It's Why You Feel Awful by Tara Hayel. I think that's how you say your name. It's talking about how like at the beginning of the pandemic, we all felt like this surge of like adrenaline. It's like when you're in the midst of a traumatic situation and we're like, go, oh, okay, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to do this thing. I mean, sometimes that can happen and drop pretty quickly um, for some people, but for a lot of parents, it was like, okay, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Now we're, you know, six, seven, almost eight months in and the, that surge capacity is feeling depleted and depleted in order to really kind of like take care of it to get back on, we have to go back to these very simple, simple kinds of things instead of trying so hard to do the best ever. Um, we'll get to that, right? It's just being able to come back and get simple and take care of ourselves. And then the last thing is just my card with my information on it. So if you want to get in contact with me for any reason, please feel free. I love to answer questions for people. Um, I can tell you that I am full as of right now, <laughs> that can change over time, but I am not able to take any new clients at this time, but I am happy to answer any questions via email or phone um, when I have the space and time. I'm happy also, I love directing people to other therapists um, who do this kind of work. Um, JCMH is a wonderful, wonderful resource, as you can see, to be able to access a lot of this stuff. Um, and yeah, so any, any questions that you guys have, and I know we only have a little bit of maybe two minutes left <laughs> here, but if there are any questions that I can answer in the time that we have left, I'd be happy to do so. So thank you. Um, I appreciate being able to do this. Thank you so much, Susanna. We do have just a couple of questions. Um, we'll just try and keep them brief in the essence of time. Um, one person said, I have felt myself becoming overwhelmed and stressed during remote learning. Oh, sorry. I couldn't see it for a second. <laughs> I felt okay. myself become overwhelmed and stressed during remote learning and having to turn to a lot of these exercises more often than usual. How do I know when it's time to reach out for professional help? Mm. I think that's a really excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, again, like kind of like I had mentioned before, I think that one of the things that determines whether it's time to reach out for professional help is, has it been... Um, getting in the way of other things in your life long enough that you feel like you're not able to use the, the, the kind of coping and distress tolerance feel, skills that you might normally use. That's also why like the, the access to therapy, I think has gone up recently because people are starting to feel that surge capacity depleting and they're going, I don't know what else to do right now. Sometimes you can also think about this, Reaching out for professional help, there's a lot of stigma around it. And I know that Jefferson Center probably talks about this a lot. But going to therapy before you are at complete, complete crisis is often more helpful than waiting and waiting until you get to that crisis state. A lot of times people won't access therapy because they think, oh, that's only for somebody who's feeling in such crisis that they have absolutely have nowhere else to turn. It's often more helpful when people come either just before that or long before that, because then you're practicing things so that you can manage getting into that crisis state. So I would venture to say, <laughs> if you are asking that question right now, it might be worth talking to some people that you trust um, and just maybe working it out for yourself to say, okay, maybe this is a time for me to kind of look into exploring that. We don't have to absolutely be um, have a specific diagnosis to go and access therapy. Um, and also when it comes down to it too, a lot of times people feel like, oh, this is an investment. I have to pay for this. There are a lot of insurances that are paying for this right now, specifically paying for um, tele mental health. And I'm doing all of my 
stuff via telehealth right now. And I work with the only insurance company I work with is Medicaid, but I work with Colorado Access and I work with um, Colorado Community Health Alliance. So, and they pay clinicians like me so that you're not having to pay for the same kind of therapy that somebody might be paying a lot of money for. So just, it might be worth kind of exploring it <clears throat> if the question's coming up. It, it doesn't mean that you have to commit to meeting with a therapist right now. It might just mean, hey, go look on Psychology Today is a great place to kind of search and look for different therapists, put in different search things. It might mean talking to somebody like me or somebody at, J at JCMH or um, somebody else that you know that's been through it and had a good experience. I think that's a good person to talk to, so people who've had good experiences with it. Um, and then just kind of going, okay, well, I can try it out. It doesn't mean you have to be locked in either. You could go to one session with a therapist and then be like, okay, done. <laughs> so I hope that that answers the question. And if you have any more, please feel free to reach out to me. That's perfect. Thank you. Such great advice to just be willing to test it out and see what it looks like. And, you know, you don't ever have to totally commit either. Um, just one more question. Someone asked if you have any apps that you would recommend. I know you mentioned Headspace, but any others that come to mind that you could recommend? Yes. Well, I'm pretty biased with Headspace because I've been using it since like 2012 myself. <laughs> and it's also a place where I've gathered a lot of the information that I use for my own guided meditations with my own clients. Um, I just want to start with talking about Headspace for a minute because Headspace is offering, um, free, I think they're still offering free, um, so they have different levels of like memberships you can do. They're, first of all, they're offering a free thing for anyone that has a lot of distress things on it, a lot more than they had before. So if you go to Headspace and just do the free one, you can get a lot of, and again, the, the link is in that, um, that page that I had in this recording. Um, <clears throat> but you can go to that and it has different kinds of videos. It has guided meditations for specifically focused on different things. Um, it has, it just sort of directs you different things. The other thing about Headspace is you can actually go online and look up Headspace in YouTube and you can find videos that you might find on that app as well that are really, really great. They're, they're both informative, but they also sort of guide you through some of these kinds of exercises. The other thing I love about Headspace um, and I've used you know, with my kid for a long time is, I'll show you this here. So they've actually expanded it, I don't know if you can see, to where there is um, at the bottom here, you can see there's a thing for focus, meditation, sleep, exercise, um, I've started using it. There's a move, the one that I have here. It does guided meditations for running, walking, um, and run walking. I've started running this summer only because I was listening to this while I was doing it. It's amazing. They do like all sorts of yoga and strength exercises also on it. Um, it's like a one-stop shop. Um, there's a sleep thing that has all sorts of different kinds of videos uh, that you can use to help you with sleep, but then also guided meditations that they keep adding to with lots of different um, people leading these that are just absolutely amazing. I think they just added one called Moon Buggy. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's really cool. Um, and then there's a focus one now where they have focus music. And I've actually recommended this to um, clients with kids when they're like, you know, they can't focus. This is specific music that has been researched to help your brain be focused on what you're doing. You can play it in the background. You can have it on headphones while you're trying to get work done. I use it while I'm trying to do my paperwork. It has been amazing. <laughs> um, and then lastly, the thing that I really, really love about it is that in the meditation, um, in the app under meditation, there are very short things and very long meditations, guided things but they have a specific thing just for kids. And they've also partnered with Sesame Street to make videos on teaching kids breathing exercises and teaching them about different meditations for different things, whether it's relaxation and sleep, focus, calming down, um, just managing emotional stuff. So I know I'm talking a lot about Headspace, but I can't say enough about it. So the other thing I would say is that if you want the expanded version of Headspace, the other thing they're doing is for, um, frontline workers, I believe, and healthcare workers. Um, there's a list of other people that they're basically offering this to, uh, educators, they're offering this to for free for this next year. So the subscription is usually about $75 for the year, but they're offering it for everybody for this year for free, like probably from the moment you get it until then. And I think that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's still going on. 
also they have um, podcasts, which I think I might've listed there too, but Headspace has um, created a daily podcast that there's a big library of, because they started, I think, back in like June. Um, they're going to come back and do more, but it's like a daily Monday through Friday little like just thing to think about. Um, you know, other apps I think that are really great, especially when we're talking about managing our, because this is something I didn't talk about, was managing our own uh, technology use is really, really important. Um, things like the Headspace app actually have different settings on them. Like the, I don't know if you saw that, but the sleep one actually darkens the screen so that when you're looking at it at night and setting it up and putting it away somewhere to listen to, you're not getting that bright light. There's a lot of different um, things on your computer and your, your phone in particular that you can do to set. I mean, I know on the iPhone, they've now set things where you can set a timer that says, hey, it's time to go to sleep now. <laughs> because as adults, we need that more than ever, just as much as kids do. And again, this is about putting our oxygen mask on first and about being able to walk the, the talk. I am notorious for being like, oh my gosh, I've been on my phone forever, I need to put it away. But it's that catching yourself and being able to set maybe reminders and timers and things like that. It might be worth just exploring your phone with somebody who, if you don't have the technological know-how, talking to somebody else who does. I, I refer to my husband all the time because he knows about all of these different tricks and I don't always all the time, but I love learning about them. Um, just to kind of help us kind of, you know, go through and be able to shut things off and shut things down. The other app that I've heard a lot of wonderful things about, but I just never really connected with it myself is an app called Calm. So basically if you go into your app store and you just put in guided meditation or you put in relaxation or mindfulness or meditation, you're gonna find a whole lot of different things. I, my suggestion is just try them out, see what works for you because I could talk about Headspace all day and somebody over here is gonna be like, no, that didn't really work for me, I like this other thing but it's worth kind of looking it up and seeing what kinds of things compare to it. So I think they can be really helpful. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone who was able to attend today. Um, no matter what you're facing in life, like if you're feeling overwhelmed, worried, or stressed, Jefferson Center is here for you. We are open, accepting new clients, and accessing care is easier than ever um, with our virtual appointments. Visit our website at jcmh.org or follow us on Facebook for more resources and information. You can also reach us by calling 303-425-0300. Again, thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.